on tonight's South Bank show, the Icelandic pop star Björk. Hello, Björk is an original voice in pop music today, as well as being Iceland's most famous export. Although she's only 31, her career spans 20 years and encompasses jazz, folk, punk, classical, dance and electronic music. Her experimental approach to pop has resulted in new fusions and unusual combinations across musical styles. She's worked with people as diverse as Tricky and the Brodsky Quartet and written songs for Madonna and Bernardo Bertolucci. The South Bank Show travelled with Björk to her native Iceland and to southern Spain, where she was recording her third solo album. We live on a mountain Right at the top This beautiful view from the top of the mountain. Every morning I walk towards the edge and throw. things I think people are always scared of new things if you want to make something happen it hasn't happened before you've got to allow yourself to make a lot of mistakes then the real magic will happen because if you just play it really safe you won't get any treats you cannot say that Björk is copying anybody this uh, personality that's uh, absolutely unique the warmth the major attitude to life, but the uh, heart of a child and her Icelandic way of being. I come from Iceland and this harbour is probably my roots, you know, and, and, um, and the weather and, and the mountains. For me, this is the heart of Reykjavik. I never try to do things that are Icelandic, you know. I don't sort of go out my way. Just the fact that, that I, like, all my family, thousand years back, are Icelandic, and I was born here with all those things inside me, and with, with those, that face, and this, this body, you know, and, 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 and with, with these influences, I think that's enough. I don't have to... It's so much subconsciously there. I don't have to f focus on it consciously as well. But, um, but um, yeah, it, there is a bit, big chunk there. I live by the ocean. <laughs> During the night, I, I die. Underneath, I'll 
this is where I'm staying. This is my home. Well, I always sang since I was a kid. It has always been like my natural reaction, two things. My stepfather, who started with my mother when I was four, and he played me a lot of, lot of music and had a lot of time for me. And he used to sit with me every evening sometimes. And we'd write down a lot of lyrics, we'd go through things, we'd pick up the chords. And he used to be in a top 40 band in Iceland. Kaspar, Melchior, and Baltasar. They sent me to classical music school when I was five. And I was there for 10 years. It was very conservative, but I was a bit of a rebel. I would do my own little projects in the corner. I would get a lot of freedom. I would talk to a lot of... That's how I got introduced to, like, Chesse Stockhouse and electronic music. You know, I, I basically got introduced to all music there is. I mean, in European, at least. <laughs> Let's say four, five hundred years, and and uh, and uh, even though I ended up deciding that majority of it was not maybe my cup of tea, at least I knew it existed, so I could like say, okay, I've dealt with this, you know. So I think very quickly I saw, okay, you got classical music, you got pop, you got jazz, and everybody thinks their stuff is great and the rest is crap. I just really quickly loved introducing. My grandparents to Jimi Hendrix stuff, or my my mum to classical stuff, or or, um, or or bringing jazz records to school, you know. And then it just kind of came out that when I started being in bands, because I was so um, kind of obsessed with with new things getting made, that that I kind of ended up just being on the microphone, you know. But it was very natural process. I've been singing professionally more or less since I was about 11, 12. Go the good for a mammal frau, and out the mego padar or her meryao. So clad it on making outwardly. Good bless it, papa, ye claimed it to be. It's a small town where people knew I, I did gigs, I played flute, I sang. And then this guy wanted to make a children's record. It sold 5,000 copies, which, which um, is gold in Iceland. But, but then they wanted to do... Then it came out in the record company, and the record company was like... Uh, we, they wanted to do another one, but I didn't want to. I, so I um, said, OK, that's it. Because I felt very awkward. I was doing interviews and all sort of stuff, and people recognised me in the street and my school. I got much more attention than I wanted before I asked for it, where I think a lot of people don't get the attention till long after they want it. So, so, so I immediately sorted out in my head that that's not what I want. I want to make music. She can be extremely childlike in her voice, or it can be totally in command and like an absolute queen. The sort of exaggeration of emotions is, is what really comes through in her voice.
century for Iceland because like 100 years ago my grandparents generation they they were brought up in in like mud houses the lifestyle was like middle ages you know and then we became independent in 1944 and we became after World War two like uh, I think the fifth richest country in the world or something like really quickly it developed in, in maybe 80 years what say England has developed in 400 years it's so quick that it's almost violent. Iceland was a colony uh, for uh, six or seven hundred years, and it was treated very badly by the Danish. And, and, and uh, we were not allowed to play in music and dance. It was uh, supposed to be a, an act um, from the devil or something. And, and so what we got obsessed with was uh, storytelling and the sagas, you know, that's all our culture is basically literature, very literature based. Probably the, the most important music in Iceland was half talking and half singing, kind of chanting. Freyðrum ganga fuglar frá, flöktan dranga bjarga, sólar vanga syngja hjá, sálma langa og marga. Björk, she uses uh, her voice in a very specific way. There is a specific sound in her voice. And uh, you can say the same about uh, the voice of the, of the old Icelandic choirmen who were uh, reciting the Rímur. It's not a singing voice, not exactly. It's not a speaking voice. It's somewhere in between. While you are away. Women of the sagas were very strong, and Björk is one of them. It is said about the Icelanders that they are bold in art. They do not calculate the steps. If I do this today, this will happen tomorrow. They do today what they have to do today. All that's very Icelandic, because we live with this nature and the elements that we have to defy all the time. We are not thinking about it every day, but it forms our character, of course. I think when you come from a place where nature can kill, I mean, you could literally not be here in a week. That sort of makes you humble. And I think it's healthy, it puts you in your place. such a thing as Icelandic characteristics. We're talking about an individual who's fiercely independent. 
It's like so self-sufficient. It's like arrogant. And, and like anarchy is just like some of the people who invented anarchy like 100, 200 years ago. You know, Iceland people is like so. <laughs> Sounds of Icelandic music was happening in 7980, and so that scene was like has been called the Icelandic punk scene because that scene it was like so much do it yourself. It was not like a political thing like um, right wing or left wing or anything like that. We were singing in Icelandic and we were dealing with Icelandic reality and we were putting out our records and, and um, doing basically everything ourselves. It was, you know, very stupid local sense of humor. Bunch of 16-year-old terrorists drinking absinthe that we smuggled from Spain and writing terrible tunes and being arrested a lot of times and, and having art exhibitions and making our own films and, and, and basically art, sort of terrorism, if you want, sort of sabotaging what we thought was really snotty. <laughs> I think the people that ended up forming Cook and the Shoe Cube's bad taste, um, they um, they were they were bound to meet, you know, because in such a small town, having the same obsession, basically being terrified of mediocrity. I think that was always been our biggest enemy: that mediocrity, materialism, a narrow-mindedness, um, small town mentality, and we'd do anything to to break that down. girl has a voice like an ice pick. Such a pure sound. When the Sugar Cubes played with you two, I would be preparing in the dressing room, and even if I couldn't hear the band, I couldn't hear anything. You know, I could just hear this low rumble through these, you know, stadium walls or whatever we happen to be playing. I could always seem to hear that voice. It just, it, it seemed to travel through metal and concrete and glass and, you know, 50,000 punters, and I, you know, just, went straight to my heart, what can I tell you? There was nothing like it. There was a void in the world of pop music and suddenly there was a light and it happened to be us and we were from Iceland and we were the sugar cubes. Somebody told me that uh, birthday had been chosen single of the week in Melody Maker and my response was oh shit because I knew it was trouble and boy it did prove out to be trouble for us. There was like companies that came here and got offered us 60 trillion billions and 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 we just told them all you know to F U C K off because we were being terrorists and all that. And that took about one and a half year that we just kept sending them back. The agenda of the Sugar Cubes was ne never to become like world famous. We were doing this for fun. Two, even three of the Sugar Cubes were probably the most promising poets or writers of Iceland's new generation. And they were finding themselves, they hadn't written a letter for two years. Um, um, because they were doing sound checks in like Texas and Alabama and playing, doing guitar solos and which, which is kind of funny. I mean, it is funny, but it's only funny for so long, you know? The trappings of the business, I think, were the, like the end of the sugar cubes. We just had had enough. 
and we were all friends. And so instead of spoiling a very good friendship, we destroyed a business relationship. I had been making music like for theater, for film, like pop stuff, um, jazz stuff, um, experimental stuff, electronic stuff. Basically try everything, basically work with everybody in Iceland, but always with other people's visions. to London to make my own album. It was time for me then to write songs about me. I was 27. I thought, okay, you know, you're a coward if you don't try more things. It was a very big decision to move, mostly because of my son. And I'm a really family-orientated person. When I came to London, I was very looking. And, and, and I was very sure that I, I wasn't going to do... I was going to do an album that hadn't been done before. So, um, when I'm... The people I was most attracted to and, and the scene I was most attracted to when I came here was people who knew as little as I did about what was going to happen. Not people that had already established things, but people that were still trying to sort of enter in the unknown, if you want, and, and trying to discover something that, that hadn't been discovered before. London is gorgeous because it functions as a, as a brewing pot for people from all over the planet on similar missions to me. And if I don't talk to them regularly and, and I don't see them play regularly, I just go mad. You know, in Iceland, I was very much the odd one out, you see. I just need to know that I'm not the only one. And the people that ended up in my band, without me planning it, so were like one person from Iran, one from India, one from Turkey, one from Cyprus, one from Barbados. It's a bit like Immigrants United. For me, the whole uh, Britpop thing and the o Oasis thing and the whole guitar thing is this kind of British scare of losing Britishness and the immigrants taking over in that. English people, like the Britpop scene, they just seem to repeating and trying to sort of hold the Victorian flag alive, but it's just, you know, dead, you know. And, and it don't seem to, to be doing anything fertile. Nostalgia is the order of the day for the most here. Except in dance culture and club culture, people look to the future, which is, I think, why Björk was attracted to, to that. <laughs> Exactly, all right. Yeah. Yeah. I keep coming up, keep missing you. Well. Oh, no, no, I haven't been here for a while. Good stuff, yeah. Yeah. One's excellent, like really good underground, minimal techno, with some really mad lock grooves on it as well. But kind of like sort of 80s disco sort of stuff. It sounds like. But this is one from Germany, which is the guys called Dynamo, which is really, really cool. It's kind of like on that Herbert sort of tip, which is really good. If she is shopping around, she's the. Uh... Imelda Marcos of good ideas, uh, and what's wrong with that? I mean, that's what you do, isn't it? You just, you shop around. I can't wait to hear you see us then, huh? What are you doing? Just obsessed with people with exciting ideas, and, and it's a bit of a weakness of mine, really. I've got no interest in working with people who just do what I tell them to do. You know, I, it's just no point. I might as well just do it myself then. So I'd much rather work with people who are just as strong as me and preferably stronger. And so it's like um, I give nine billion and they give nine billion or whatever, and, and that's the kick. She is able to hold on to her identity, um, to her own style, no matter who she collaborates with. And a lot of the musical combinations that she has have never been done before. Come to me, I'll take care of
In 1993, Björk released her first solo album of original work. It turned her into an international star. She followed with a second album in 1995, and then, after four years in the limelight, the pressure got too much. She vented her feelings on a journalist at Bangkok Airport. I had all these songs inside me, and the only way to get them out of my system was to put me in extreme danger. I think you can only do that for so long. So I did that for four years, and then it just exploded. <laughs> When you've gone to that sort of speed of, of living, like 9,000 miles per hour, you don't exactly fade, fade down. I think you sort of explode, really, and crash. That's what I did. Björk does not need adulation, adoration for her to make her music. And being stared at in the street and whispering there's Björk does her more harm than anybody People sh can, ex you know, they don't know how much harm they're doing. Iceland's pop queen leaving her home in West London late this afternoon, still distressed at the discovery she'd been the target of a crazed fan's attempt to harm her. You know, I'm just, it's just kind of a very sad thing, you know, obviously when somebody shoots their face off, you know, it's terrible. I'm not sure if I'll dream very properly for a while. Must be very private. These are the last pictures of the bomber. His body was discovered after neighbours called police. Bizarrely, he'd filmed himself making the chemical explosive. People shouldn't take me too literally and, and, and get involved in my personal life. I make music for people, you see. Basically, the bomb got sent to my house and I moved away from London and freaked out in Spain. And, and then I realised it was just kind of one guy who did that, really. You can't blame that on a nation, can you? You know? But, but it is... It's, it doesn't matter when that happens to you, it doesn't matter what people say to you. You just, there's no logic. It's just when you've gone through that experience, you just, you just want to go and never come back, you know? Much of the past year, Björk has been living in southern Spain, where she recorded her third solo album. I think there's something very special about living at the um, edges of, of continents, and it fe just feels completely different, and it shouldn't, you know, that you look out the window and you can see another continent over there, and, and it's just kind of like, it's a really healthy turn on somehow. The idea that every morning you could wake up and literally go to Africa. When I lived by the ocean there, I used to wake up every morning and have to walk for like an hour and, and like cross. And then I felt like I was in Spain. And then I could work. And I wake up the morning after and I still hadn't just grasped the idea. So I had to do that for a month. And then I moved up here to the mountain. And, and the only way I can take all this in, because it's just so outrageous, and, and I, I keep just thinking of mum, just looking at her back. It's just like, they're going to pull the curtains in a sec. <laughs> These are the things that I own, that I usually have in my house, where I do all the demos. So we, we set this up and brought this down to Spain. When I did debut and post, they were very much like greatest hits of my musical passions for all my life. And I knew it would take two albums to do that. That's why I called them debut and post before and after of getting rid of the back catalogue almost, you know, gracefully, you know, because you can only move on if you do that, you know? So this is like a fresh start for me. And that's why I want to call this album homogenic or genus or genius or whatever. I'm still working on that because it's one flavor. It's just me now, you know, here. And, and it's going to be, instead of like all these different instruments, it's just going to be beats, strings and voice. <laughs> Ég var eitt. 
einhver tíma myndavélin að fara í taugarnar á okkur. Þá láti mig vita að því að þetta er númer eitt. I knew that this album would be like back to Iceland sort of what I'm about. But it's very hard to kind of start from complete scratch with no tradition whatsoever. But there were some pioneers who were trying to look at the landscape and, and the country and try to change that, what they saw and what they felt into audio. There are certain Icelandic composers and when they compose Icelandic music, they, you know, try to imitate geysers or volcanoes because the landscape in Iceland is very rough. It's, you know, we don't have like this, you know, trees. We don't barely have any trees. We have a lot of lavas, we have a lot of volcanoes and there's a lot of outburst of, you know, whether suddenly the wind comes or snowstorms. And that kind of sounds, I think she's looking after. And she's talked about that. She wants more of this raw sound, not this beautiful European sound, maybe. To find that voice is, is very challenging, you know. And it's almost like you have to invent your own roots. And that's one of the reasons why I got the eight string players. I wanted them all to be Icelandic. Well, I picked up some her uses of intervals, for instance, fifths, and that's very traditional in Iceland and actually very unique. Icelandic folk songs often use this interval of fifths it throughout you know the whole song and that and she uses that in her pieces that makes, makes it very icelandic for instance the hunter the two cellos they are playing two bar motif and you know one of them plays the lower note then the other cellist plays it a fifth above and and there when you hear that that's just right away you know that's icelandic <laughs> I wrote a song called Hunter, and it's based on um, what my grandmother told me on Christmas about two different types of birds who are um, birds that always have the same nest all their lives, like swans, and they always have the same partners all life. And then there are birds that travel all the time, and they always have different partners all the time. And kind of like um, to make a conscious decision to stay a hunter. It kind of ended up being a little bit of a bolero, I guess, maybe because it's Spain. That's the only song with the string arrangement I asked their daughter to do completely. One of the notes that we had, we discussed maybe trying a figure such as a bolero, you know, Ravel's bolero. In the course of the recording, we decided to exaggerate certain aspects of, of the string parts by having the strings doing sliding notes and kind of sluggish and slurring. When she sends me something, it's, it's pretty much done. What she, what I understand that, and that I, and I was correct in uh, understanding it that way, is that she really wants a color. She really wants the humanizing factor into tracks that are basically, um, how do you say, sequenced using different sounds or using electronic sounds. It's good also if we put one take down and have that as well. Mm -hmm. We come tomorrow and we then we, got, more we can so. listen to it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And then we know what to fix, Absolutely. if that works or not. But at least we put it down. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you.
to work quite a lot with QY20. That's a different machine, the same size. And you have um, eight tracks and 100 noises. And, and you can make as many songs as you want. And a lot of my tunes for the last four years I wrote on that. It's, just, it's so incredibly uh, convenient. Put the batteries in and you can take it. You can, you can write on the airplane or your grand's house on the top of a volcano or in a club or in a tube. And, and, and but this is a different machine. This is like a sampler. Mark Bell bought this one and he's just teaching it. It's just a way of capturing like noises, like say acoustic instruments or you know other noises, but then uh, being able to change the pitch of them, you know, like to make them, you know, any noise into like music then. Like it could be a door shutting for a drum sound. What I'd love to do live is kind of put a lot of effects on my voice. conscious choice that the beats for this album will be very simple, almost naive, but still um, very natural, but very explosive, like they're still in the making, which for me is very much Iceland. And we would collect very slowly over a period of almost a year, a library of noises. Iceland is geographically probably the youngest country on the planet. It's still uh, changing and growing and very raw. A lot of the eruptions at least a few hundred years ago. Then the lava was very thin and went over a big area very quickly. And it went over lakes and steam broke through of the pressure through the new lava and they made little hills. So there's a lot of energy here. I wanted the beach to be like this. Electricity. My dad's an electrician, and my grandfather too. And I've been obsessed since I was a kid with people like Stockhausen, uh, Kraftwerk, Brian Eno. <laughs> Electricity has always existed, and it's not just a phenomenon of this century. And, and it's always been in thunder and lightnings, and, and, and in Iceland, the Thor's hammer, you know. And, and acupuncture has been around for one or two thousand years. The electricity and equipment are just tools. Instead of wood or, or, or leather or metal and all these things that we so far made music out of, stroking a, a string, we're using electricity and, and to, to make for the air. For me, that is probably what I would call techno. And it's so uh, amazing when people uh, tell me that, that um, electronic music has not got soul and they blame the computers. They got the finger and point at the computer. It's like, there's no soul here. It's like, you can't blame the computer. If there's not soul in the music, it's because nobody put it there. And it's not the tool's fault. You think you deny me or something While 
I've got plenty You are the one who's missing out But you won't notice Until after five years If you live that long You'll wake up A loveless I dare you to take me on I dare you to show me your pals I'm so bored of cowards That say they want, then they can't handle There is like a purpose behind it where the drums are really hard and then the voice beautiful is just like the contrast for something to be beautiful it's something's got to be you know ugly if everything's beautiful and you know nothing's beautiful you can't handle love baby you can't handle love oh it's obvious you can't handle When you first meet an Icelander, sometimes they are cold. But then, when they warm up to you, they are, they are very fiery. We are very fiery people. You are in all these different moods through one week. You, you are grumpy, you, you're, you're cheerful, you're stupid, you're, um, you're delicate, you're, you're um, complicated, you're moody. And, and of course, there's, there's a song for every occasion, you know? Joy is the hardest thing of all to put across, whether you're a painter or a filmmaker or whatever you do, you know? And it's easy to paint with black, it's easy to to, to be angry, but the ecstasy, you know, in her voice is, uh, is unusual. When I lost my cards, you deal me another hand. Even when I sleep, you're real. On your way to me, you don't have to speak. Most of my work, I do in my head, just when I'm doing other things. And, and, and um, I don't know if it's because I've been doing it for long or, or because I, I spent so many years without recording my songs. I wasn't until 27, I started recording them. It had naturally become quite organised in my head and I got all these different sections and little cupboards and drawers. And I started that idea and I put it in a drawer and I can come back to it a year later and it will still be there. So I walk in a room and, and it looks like I'm starting a song, but it's actually, in a way, I've maybe been working on it for a year. Are they getting better? Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
And it's usually just the theme of that month, like the soundtrack to that month in my life. This is the lyric to a song about my best uh, mate, Yoka. But all the other pages, there's absolutely no way I'll open for you, whatever you offer me, because that's so private. It's scary. And I've got a beautiful secret code, which is called Icelandic. So you guys will never find out what says in this. inside of me every nerve that hurts you hear deep inside of me Ooh, you don't have to speak I feel Number one, two, three, four, and five, and all the way up to 73, I'm a pop musician. And I'm, I, I'm making music for everyone, not for, for uh, VIP or, or educated people or, or something like that. So I want to make that, um, it has to be pop music, you know, that everybody can relate to. And, and, and so, so it's, it's a challenge. It's an experiment, and I've got a clue we'll work on it, but you have to try. Next week, the South Bank Show reviews the work of author Ian Banks. South Bank Show, in association with the Sunday Telegraph, the art of a perfect Sunday.